Hi guys, welcome to my movie fan channel. My name is Tyler. Today's review of the MCU video is going to be for Guardians of the Galaxy 2. These Guardian movies are some of the funnest and most hilarious adventures in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I love the teamwork and camaraderie between this ragtag bunch of misfits and every time they add a character to the group, which they do in this movie a couple times, it just gets funnier and funnier. And I love the interplay between them all. I also love that these movies feel like a pocket universe within the MCU. And James Gunn really kicked the door open for the cosmic universe of the MCU. But each one of these movies has their own vibe and their own flavor. And the Guardians movies definitely have a unique vibe. And you definitely get the sense that James Gunn has a plan going forward of what he wants to do with each movie. The first movie was about Peter Quill and his mother dies. And it's him finding his place in this world, dealing with the loss of his mother and not knowing where he belongs, trying to find a family. And all the characters are looking for family. So family is kind of the theme of that one. In volume two, Peter Quill is reunited with his father that he's never known. And he has to form a relationship with him and deal with the fact that he ends up being kind of a dick. It's rumored that volume three is about finding his love, Gamora which is like the love of his life. So it's interesting. It was like the father, the mother, and then his biggest love of his life. And then trying to win her back because she doesn't remember who he is because it's the Gamora from way before. That's how Endgame set it up. So that would be really interesting to see that as the storyline going through. It would fit with the themes of family and especially revolving around Star-Lord and his life. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the music in these movies, Guardians movies, and Volume 2 especially. The score is awesome and it gets a little bit underrated with how good the soundtracks are and how much everybody loves them. And music just is an integral part of this movie to the point that Brandy, one of the songs in the soundtrack, is a part of the storyline. It's used as a metaphor by Ego for why he left Star Wars' mother. And it was really just like a sales pitch to Peter. But it was interesting to see that they weave that into the story and it kind of apply. Speaking of Ego, I believe he was the first villain in a while that they attempted to, and I believe succeeded, in making them a fairly well-rounded adversary to the team. He was both a physical threat and a mental threat to them, which doesn't happen a lot. It's usually one or the other, and they're kind of like lackluster or don't have a good motivation. They're just kind of like mustache trolling villains. He had decent motivations, and it was backed up by the performance of Kurt Russell, who's always awesome in every movie, and I thought it was funny that he was like, I took this form that I thought you would be most pleased in, and I'm like, man, he must like the thing or something before he left Earth or what I don't know whatever thing would be the time period of when Star Lord left Earth but I was like yeah Kurt Russell's badass I would want him to be my dad too but and then uh, it was funny with the cameo David Hasselhoff that was great uh, he's in the end credits too considering villains like Hela Killmonger Vulture Stereo Thanos they all come in the subsequent movies following this one I believe this was really a turning point for how Marvel creators viewed their writing process towards the villains. They were like, we're going to give them more. Not that anybody goes into the movie like, we're going to make a shitty villain. But they said, we're going to give them more to work with as the actors. Uh, when they read the script and read this character and then portray it. And also, just within the writing, it's built in that these characters were destined to be more than some of the earlier villains that we got that were a little less three-dimensional. I always forget about the Adam Warlock teaser at the end when I watch this movie over again. I'm like, oh yeah. And then, like, every time I rewatch it, I rewatch it a couple times. I'm like, oh yeah. I forgot about that because it's been so long since they touched on it. They're just trying to push these other Avengers movies out. That's where the storyline was building up. So I wonder if in Guardians 3, he's going to show up. Maybe in Captain Marvel or Thor, one of the other kind of cosmic, more cosmic movies. Or if... Maybe he's not, and maybe they made James Gunn put that in there as just kind of a setup that they left dangling for somebody else to pick up on. But I feel like he might want to touch upon that in one of the movies he's a part of because it was in his film. I also loved the Gamora and Nebula relationship gets further expanded in this movie. You see why Nebula is so jaded and so dead set on going after Gamora and the stories that they tell about growing up and just their arguments that they have in this movie being forced together again in another kind of situation. Of all the jokes in this movie, too, I think Drax 
was given a lot of the jokes. He didn't have a lot of the action. People really criticized these movies for that. I like that he just jumped in the thing and was like stabbing the monster in the beginning. And I like what he calls Mantis Ugly. Um, they give him a lot of like goofy jokes with his nipples. And that nipple joke comes back into play like at the end of the movie. And he slaps the thing on him. And it really hits for me every time. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> they set it up and they like, leave it there. And at the end, Dave Batista comes in and he hits that joke out of the park. Oh, my nipples. I also like what they did with Rocket. They kind of gave him time with Yondu, and they had kind of mirroring stories going on. That was interesting. It was everybody had a little storyline. Speaking of Yondu, when he did the Mary Poppins thing, that was the core of the movie. That's everybody came away from that. Mary Poppins, y'all. It was funny. And Baby Groot, man. How do we not talk about Baby Groot? So I guess when this movie came out, they didn't know supposedly how successful Baby Groot was going to be. And it's like, dude, you, you not know by now we like cute shit. Look at Baby Yoda. And what happened with that, they didn't have toys coming out for either one of these. And I guess Baby Yoda was maybe because they didn't want to spoil it. I don't know. But you would think they would have learned their lesson from Baby Groot where they underestimated the popularity of this thing. They didn't have any toys right. It's like, you we want cute shit. Do you not understand? For Baby Guru alone, I will tell you to go back and rewatch this movie when you're sad or something. <laughs> Even when you're not, this movie will cheer you up. Uh, just see Yanu flying through the air like Mary Poppins. That uh, puts a smile on my face all the time. That's my review for Guardians of the Galaxy, guys. I'm going to upload a video, most likely a short little video that just explains my release schedule because I'm going to be doing my first Star Wars reviews, which are going to be for The Mandalorian, and I'm going to do two a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm going to have one on Tuesday, one on Thursday, and then along with the content schedule that I already put up on all my social medias. So I just want to kind of clarify that because I put them as two separate things. So tune in for that tomorrow and also the first review of The Mandalorian Episode 1, Chapter 1, The Mandalorian. <laughs> And I'm real excited for that one, guys. I think it's one of my better reviews because I was all over that thing. I, that's it for me, guys. <laughs> I'll see you in the next video.